Okay, so the way I see it, uh, and the way I got into gender and sex differences uh, and healthcare, is that there are multiple interrelated phenomena that are at the intersection of these constructs, gender, sex, and medicine. Uh, and I don't know exactly how they interact with each other, but uh, what I've noticed in my work is that it's hard to think of one without thinking about how the other things are complicating or, or work. So first is that sex and gender do have an impact on health. Second, that there are gender-based differences in care, and in particular, there are gender, potential gender bias and gender disparities in care outcomes. And the third one is that we don't know much about reproductive health beyond fertility. Uh, in particular, the role of reproductive hormone and their dynamics. Emma has done amazing work on menstrual cycle, and uh, I'll be talking about some of that. So I'm not the first to, to think about that. There's, there's a lot of work out there. I like these two papers. Um, they, they do say something along the line of research highlights a myriad ways of sex and gender play a role in health and disease. However, these clinically relevant insights have yet to be systematically inter in incorporated in care. So there's a translation issue here. There's a lot of individual studies that there are um, differences, clinical differences in disease presentation for some diseases in uh, care for others, uh, but we don't have yet solutions to remedy for these biases. Um, the second has to do with these uh, issues of gender bias in particular. Uh, again, two papers that I really keep going back to. The first one is a two-way gender of bias in medicine, and the second one looks at a very specific phenomenon but very telling, which is about the treatment of pain in women. Um, and uh, the, the quote that I particularly like is from uh, the first paper that I show here, which is that there, the, this bias is complicated, that on one hand, um, gender is viewed as there's no differences between men and women, and therefore maybe we don't need to include women in research because they're the same. Um, but the second way is that women are very different from men, and in fact they you know, tend to be a little historical and, and maybe experience pain a little bit differently than men who are more stoic. Uh, and the last one is uh, about that, that third point. Again, lots of work about how much we know nothing about the reproductive health system and uh, reproductive hormones, uh, and so there's a lot of work to be done. Now, as a biomedical informaticist and a computer scientist, what is interesting to me as well is that that's already a fairly complex topic, but now we have technology and we have AI and new data sources, and now we have an, yet another layer of complexity. Um, and so I want to tell you very quickly about two uh, research questions, and then I'll go into what I really promised to talk about today, uh, which are the gender differences. So the first one is menstrual tractors are a perfect example of femtech. Maybe you've heard this term. It's, uh, it's thought about as technology for women that empowers women because we uh, collect new data about women. And the question is, are they really feminist? And by feminist here, I'm using kind of a feminist human computer interaction paradigm, which is very similar to the data feminism uh, principle that Catherine uh, outlined. Uh, but basically, they're not looking at just male, female, binary differences, but also all gender and types of uh, um, marginalized population. And if we look at how these data are collected in menstrual trackers, what does it mean about the data that they collect, and how careful should we be about analyzing this data? The second one is, uh, we also talked a little bit about this uh, yesterday, that there are a lot of missing data set, and data being political, if we don't have this data, we can't uh, prove certain points that we know are probably happening. Um, and so what are these data missing that we could, if we had access to them, help advance knowledge of sex and gender informed medicine? And finally, are there uh, existing biases about care that could translate into biased AI model? And the reason we really care about this is, one, because a lot of AI models are going to be built on this data, but also because these data are the ones that influence policies and clinical guidelines. Okay, so I want to look at the first one, and thank you, Emma, for uh, explaining everything about menstrual trackers. 
Um, so the first is, there are a lot of menstrual trackers, it's just a few of them. And with my student and a bunch of um, menstrual and gender justice researchers, we did kind of a review of these, of these apps. And maybe, I don't know if it kind of comes across here, the, the colors are a little subdued, but there's a lot of pink. Uh, and there are other things that are happening. Uh, but basically, uh, the finding, sorry, the finding is that they're, they're, is, they, they're not feminist, basically, <laughs> is a finding. They completely flatten the experience of menstruation. Uh, menstruation means uh, contraception or fertility. They ignore gender differences. They ignore other types of menstruators that could exist out there. People with uh, no access to home or food or anything like that. And these things sound like they're not relevant to menstrual cycle tracking, but they're actually quite important. So if you're interested in this, I, I put um, or paper here, the messiness of the menstruator. Um, so what does that say about the data? I think clearly with this data, there is an opportunity to learn about menstruation, but we want to refrain from learning anything about that could be social or could mean anything about the menstruators because it's so unclear and there's no standard about how these data are collected. So um, it's no surprise that Emma and I are partnering with Clue for Data. This is one of the menstrual trackers that's very transparent, very much research-oriented, and is, in fact, one of the most gender-inclusive uh, tracker out there. And so my, the, the one study that I, there's many we've done, but the one study I want to point out here is that when we are careful, we, we want to focus on population-level analysis, and we want to be uh, advancing physiological knowledge of menstruation. And so we, um, we started from this very, very large data set focused on menstruators who are in stable reproductive age. It's a very short window of time from 21 to 34 years old. Um, and somehow really tried to pay attention to the data that we have, looked at people who have what we call natural cycle, meaning no hormones or anything like that, so that we could really get at the physiological dynamics of menstruation. And we found a few things that are very exciting. The first one is that about, so we're looking at this point once we start you know, filtering from these millions of, of, of individuals, we have about 500,000 uh, individuals that we're analyzing. And we found that in this 500,000 patient population, there is 10% of the population that has um, irregular cycles. So that means cycle length is just all over the place. Um, they don't have any variation in period length, but they have variation in cycle length. And that, moreover, the cycle length is uh, associated or consistent with increased symptom volatility. So what this hints at us is that there are at least 10% of the population of menstruators that have probably some reproductive disorder. And I would, I would argue, I don't know this from this data, that many of them do not know that there is something wrong with their menstruation and are probably experiencing other symptoms. Okay, so the second one is, what did are missing that can help advance knowledge of sex and gender um, informed medicine? And so speaking of menstrual cycle, the current knowledge about reproductive hormones um, is quite, uh, it lacks. Uh, it's highly, it comes, so the data sources that we have are from highly aggregated hormone levels across a very large population where we miss any information about individuals. Or the individual cycles of 40 white healthy women from the 70s. Uh, none of these data sources are available. And I think we can do better. So again, with a lot of different uh, types of researchers from me, we've been working on how to create new data sets that collect individual level dynamics of reproductive hormones, contextualize the data better, because now we, you know, since the 70s, we've learned a few things, and make sure that we collect this data uh, ethically in alignment with the values of individuals and with respect of their autonomy and control. So there are a lot of actual technical questions about how to do this, and if you're interested, I'm not completely ignore them, but we have a few papers. The second 
type of missing data that we've been focusing on, I mentioned it yesterday when I introduced myself, is uh, that we know very little about conditions that are quite prevalent, like endometriosis, estimated to be 6 to 10 percent of reproductive hormones, and complete dearth of data about the disease. So we built a community of about 12,000 patients. Uh, it's a lot of work to build a community. There is a lot of people that are helping me do that. But the primary goal of building this community was to partner with the patients and use principles of citizen science to build a new data set about endometriosis. And I'm happy to say that, in fact, the work that we've done has uh, already yielded very interesting findings about endometriosis that are kind of now influencing what we know now about the disease. Okay, so how much time do I have? I'm going too quickly, oh, but... Let's see. You have about another nine minutes. Yay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to actually breathe. Um, so <laughs> I want to tell you about... You have more than that. You have 19 minutes. No, that's impossible. No, okay, fine. Somehow it took one minute to say all of that to you guys. Uh, so, oh, so, sorry. Okay, nine. Nine. That sorry. sounds more like it. Okay. Um, so I want to focus about this question of gender differences, and I'm going to focus on diagnosis. So why diagnosis? Patterns of diagnosis. Uh, one is that early diagnosis is uh, something that we want. When we can detect a condition in a patient, we have more time for interventions and making uh, conditions better. And the reverse of that is that if we have delayed diagnosis, that brings additional adverse outcomes to uh, someone's disease prediction because we're missing, um, we're missing potential treatments. But also there's kind of a psychosocial uh, component here, which is that while people don't have access to the right diagnosis, they also have misdiagnoses uh, assigned to them, and that brings a lot of questions into people's mind. Okay. So once we say that, and we set this for our task, now the question is how do we translate this into operational type of data questions? And so we, um, we look at um, disparities in diagnoses, and we pay attention to access to diagnosis, so we're going to look at prevalence and time to diagnosis. Um, the data that we're using uh, for, and that I'm going to show you about is a lot of people. Um, we have claims data, CCA, Medicaid, Medicare. Then we have our electronic health record at Columbia University. So two different types of data, claims data and electronic health record data. Also two different, many different types of payers. Um, CCA is a private insurance. Medicare, Medicaid are two different government-based um, payers. And then EHR has a mix and a heterogeneous set of people in terms of payment, but has more of a homogeneous population in terms of where they come from. Definitely not in their diseases, but where they come from locally. We, since um, what I'm showing you, we've been extending our analysis to many other sites in the US. Um, and so I want to pause here for a second and say we are fully aware of all the limitations of this data. Um, they, they have all sorts of issues. Um, we talked about the fact that the labels might be completely unreliable. Talk about the fact of that term of garbage in, garbage out. Um, what I want to argue is that it's still a data set that we want to use for analysis, and we might still learn something from them. The first reason is that the type of question we're asking is not about health, biological, physiological, or anything like that. They're about patterns of care in the healthcare system. And these type of observational data are perfect for this. They completely reflect how clinicians think about their patients. Um, also, kind of a very practical point is that, you know, we might be very upset at this data set, but there's the ones that are currently used when we train AI systems out there, in particular claims data. And the third one is that there's a lot of people who care about making this data better. They're already, you know, in EHR data and claims data, they're better um, standardization of SOGI, sexual orientation and gender identity. 
of race, there is this idea uh, which I think uh, someone, I don't remember who mentioned, uh, the Balbin paper where we start to have genomic ancestry that is different from self-reported race. And there's all sorts of other social and behavioral determinants of health that um, clinicians, informaticians are trying to standardize and include into these observational data. And finally, they are, there's a lot of data. Uh, and it's individual level. It's not aggregated, and it's longitudinal. So we have sometimes more than 10 years worth of these patients' uh, records. So that's some of the limitations. And finally, you know, my, my final limitation thing is, let's be judicious in our analysis. Let's try to control for a few things. It's easy to get excited about a lot of data, and so, when I'm going to talk about these differences in, in diagnosis patterns, we're already kind of controlling for a few things. First of all, we're controlling for access to care. So these are not people who don't have access to care. These are people who are in a system and uh, have either one year, three years, or 10 years of continuous observation in their system. Um, and the way we think about this is, yes, there are tremendous disparities in access to care. What is kind of worrisome is that even when you have access to care, there are still uh, disparities out there. Um, we compare across settings. We're very interested in generalizability of our finding. Um, we want to ensure that the data quality is passes a few checks. And so we focus on this Odyssey type of data that has a lot of quality checks. And we are not trying to learn anything. We're trying to characterize data. We're not yet at the point where we feel we can mitigate biases. We want to look for these biases. So um, I'm skipping over many, many methodological questions. It's hard to detect who has what diseases, surprisingly, in this data. It's hard to quantify time to diagnosis. But what I want to tell you is the following, and I'm giving you here are some findings from uh, one of the largest databases, which is this private insurance, is that in terms of prevalence, when you look at every single diagnosis code out there, so we're talking about 16,000 types of conditions that are diagnosed, women are always more likely to be diagnosed with them. Not always, I shouldn't say that, but are significantly more likely to have a diagnosis. Um, for example, uh, what do I have here? There's a about, well, I'm not going to go into the detail. The, the second point is that um, there's a difference at the age at which patients are diagnosed. So there's about uh, 327 conditions out there where there's a 10-year-plus difference between um, men and women, whereas it's, there's only 66 of conditions where men have a lag compared to women in their age at first diagnosis. Um, we then kind of uh, went from these 16,000 conditions and looked at 112 conditions that we know and really uh, trust are well identified into these data sets, and we pay attention to uh, time to diagnosis. So again, glossing over many details, but maybe you can see here that there's green and purple, and green is always before purple. Uh, and what that means is that across all of these conditions, women are um, diagnosed later than men. Now, what's interesting to me is that these analyses are looking at symptoms that are common across men and women. We've done all sorts of different ways of quantifying, uh, but that's uh, the findings that we get. So across all databases, most phenotypes, in fact, there was only one phenotype, one condition for which there was a reversal of this pattern, women experience longer time to diagnosis than men. And so when I report these findings, there's a lot of questions that people say. They say, well, that could be because men and women present differently in their diseases. And yes, except that these 112 phenotypes come on purpose from all types of diseases we could have, from cancers to metabolic conditions to cardiovascular, etc. And we know that while there are some, not every single disease out there has a biological component that differs from this. Plus, we're looking at many of these common symptoms. Um, is it because men 
only come to their doctor when they're at the age of death, which is a kind of a trope. That is not the case. That's not what we find in our data at all. Um, and uh, is it only for this type of conditions that we know are difficult? And again, that's not the case. I'm not talking about a lot of, the, of analysis that we've been doing with intersectionality of gender, race, and, and type of healthcare. What is interesting, though, and that is uh, quite fascinating to us, is that when you add race, we lose kind of this like consistency across websites, which is hinting at us, again, that this label of race is just not the right one to look at. OK, so those are very quickly all of the research questions that we've been looking at. And I want to thank all the people uh, in my lab, my collaborators, and endometriosis patients in my community. Thank you, guys. Thank <laughs> you.